The Department of Justice has a duty to act on this referral and others we have sent. Without enforcement of congressional subpoenas, there is no oversight. In the United States of America, no one is above the law. This committee is doing its job. The Department of Justice needs to do theirs. I will echo what my colleagues have already said, but more bluntly, Attorney General Garland, do your job so that we can do ours. It was a riveting hearing last night. That was the January 6th Select Committee vote on those contempt referrals for Mr. Scavino and Navarro. The members expressed, shall we call it, impatience, bordering on frustration with the Justice Department last night during that vote uh, to hold those two in contempt. Uh, it is our privilege now to bring in a member of that committee, Congresswoman Zolopkin of California. Um, Congresswoman, I, I was I watched that, and it, it's clear that you all knew what you were going to say, and it was undeniable, and, and you couldn't miss that most of you made this point about the Justice Department's role. And I think there's this misperception, maybe, that norms snap back when you just stop acting like Bill Barr. And it seems that the committee is saying norms snap back when the rule of law means something again. Is that a message that you're all trying to send? Well, I think so. And certainly, the former president's uh, associates have basically thumbed their nose at the rule of law. And it's important that that not be allowed to continue. Uh, we do not take these referrals lightly. Uh, as I'm sure you know from watching the proceedings last night, we spent months and months and months with these individuals trying to get them to come in, talking to them uh, or their lawyers and in the end, uh, they just um, uh, walked away. And, you know, if the rule of law means something, you can't allow that to happen. Congresswoman, I, I think it also bears pointing out how accommodating you've been and how many people have cooperated. We focus so much on the outliers who don't, but you've spent a good chunk of time with Kaylee McEnany. We're reporting that Jared Kushner plans to come in and spend some time with all of you. What are your expectations for his meeting? Well, as you know, we don't comment on individuals coming in, but we do expect um, all witnesses to be honest and open with what they know. Uh, the committee has heard from hundreds and hundreds of people who've been very honest and spoken to us. Um, and it's helped fill in the picture, frankly, of what led up to that riot on January 6th, the, the coup that was attempted. You know, Judge Carter's decision in California earlier this week is worth reading. It's not that long. Uh, he does outline his finding that it's more likely than not uh, that the former president and his attorney, Mr. Eastman, engaged in uh, fraud and criminal conduct. Uh, at, at one point in his decision, he said this was a coup looking for a legal theory. So, uh, you know, we need to pursue this. We need to take steps to make sure that nothing like this can ever happen again, because our democracy is not out of the threat yet. We're not out of the woods yet. It is a, an extraordinary opinion, especially that, that last page. I want to read a little bit from the section you're talking about. Um, the judge writes this. Every American, and certainly the president of the United States, knows that in a democracy, leaders are elected, not installed. With a plan this bold, President Trump knowingly tried to subvert this fundamental principle. Based on the evidence, the court finds it more likely than not that President Trump corruptly attempted to obstruct the joint session of Congress on January 6, 2021. Now, coincidentally, perhaps, that is the exact statute that I believe Liz Cheney, your fellow committee member, read from a few months back. Have you made a criminal referral under that statute for Donald Trump to DOJ? We have not, uh, and obviously we're not ruling out anything. But I think it's worth noting that uh, a criminal referral from Congress amounts to basically nothing. 
uh, except when you are the victim of a crime. Now, in the case of uh, the individuals that have engaged in criminal contempt of Congress, Congress is a victim and the American people are a victim of that criminal activity. That elevates the referral uh, uh, in a way. But referring matters for prosecution under other statutes, uh, the Department of Justice is under no obligation uh, to take notice of that. And I'm sure that the Attorney General and the other lawyers in the Department of Justice have read uh, Judge Clark's decision. I don't think they need us to let them know that it happened. Ex-DOJ officials, people like Neil Katyal and um, Dan Goldman and others, expressed dismay that there doesn't appear to be any investigation of the inner circle, the, the circle that you all are investigating, the, the circle that you all have pierced, frankly. It's clear that you're in the room. You're in the Oval mm -hmm. Office with the witness testimony you have heard already, and some of which you're still pursuing. Um, what word would you use for the impression, at least, that DOJ has not pursued that inner circle? Well, I don't, we don't know what they're doing, and uh, that's appropriate. Prosecutors are supposed to do their investigation, and if they have something, you find out when they file an indictment. So that's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, the attorney general has said publicly that they will follow these cases uh, wherever they lead. And so I want to believe that that is correct. Uh, meanwhile, our committee is not, a, you know, a criminal investigation. We're a legislative body and we're going to get all of the information and we're going to make it all public for the American public. And by the way, if it's things that the Department of Justice doesn't know, they will also uh, be made aware of it. That's all we can do, really. And in terms of using all the tools at your disposal, will you um, subpoena members of Congress? Will you subpoena your own colleagues? Well, as I say, we um, are looking at all of the potential witnesses. Certainly, the documentary evidence uh, does indicate some uh, involvement um, from some of our colleagues. We have asked several of them to come in and talk to us. Uh, we have not yet issued subpoenas, and actually there are other individuals that it's becoming clear uh, have information that would be helpful to our investigation. So we have, that determination has not been made, uh, although we are willing to pursue anything that gets us closest to the truth. Can you offer any um, thoughts, and I know not specific ones um, are, are, are being made public, but in terms of this New York Times reporting today about the examination, both on the part of DOJ in the cases involving the insurrectionists themselves, as well as by, by your committee, of Donald Trump's words and the response that they garnered and the knowledge, it's in the contempt report for Mr. Scavino and, and Navarro, right. the intersection of the violence that ensued and the words that Donald Trump channeled directly to his supporters and had to have known was being targeted to those extremist groups. How, how much is that a focus? Well, it's, it's a great concern, and it's one of the reasons why we want to hear uh, from Dan Scavino. You know, he was um, the former president's um, Twitter guy, and he also was tasked, and we believe did, uh, take a note and follow some of these extremist uh, groups uh, that were talking about violence, and we believe um, that he made that information known to the president. So we need to talk to him about that. Um, the pieces are fitting together. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to try and uh, jump ahead of the actual report the committee will make. But certainly, uh, there's grave concern uh, that the president's words led to violence. And in fact, you know, members of the House and Senate said as much right after the riot. It was only after um, certain of our colleagues, the minority leader and the like, went to um, kissed the ring of the former president at Mar-a-Lago that the truth started to fade in their minds. And now they are, um, many Republicans are trying to make excuses for this violence. That, that can't stand. I, the American public know uh, that you cannot tolerate 
political violence as deciding elections. That's not the American way. Um, you've been so generous with your time. I have one more question. The wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, Ginny Thomas, is a known conservative activist, but I think it was unknown before um, some of her text messages to the ex-chief of staff, um, who's also in defiance of his subpoena, um, full subpoena from your committee, uh, were released. I, I wonder what the... Um, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you if you could tell us about the conversation you had about her, and, and, and if that's something you won't keep private. I, I wonder if you can just speak to her significance in terms of what was very public. Donald Trump called for these cases, the ridiculous ones coming out of Texas for six states not including Texas, to just get to the Supreme Court. He was desperate for a vehicle to get to the Supreme Court. Is Ginny Thomas important to understanding why Trump was so insistent on that? Well, we're looking at everything uh, relative to Ms. Thomas, and uh, I'm, I'm not in a position to make an announcement on this now, but the committee is looking at everything uh, related to any potential witness, including her. Um, we're not afraid uh, to ask people to come in, but we want to make sure that it would uh, lead to more information, that it would shed light and not just create uh, dust. So that's that's the nature of the inquiry.